friends, welcome once again to New Life in Jesus, brought to you by the Emmanuel Christian Broadcasting Network. It is a great joy and a privilege to greet you in the loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart that all good things will work together to them that love God, as it says in the Word of God. And today, as you listen to His Word, I believe that it will have a profound impact in your life and in my life, as it has and the intention of God that he has for us and is according to his plans and purposes. I want to share with you, to start with, a few statements that were made when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary. When he went along to the cross and when he, as part of the divine plan that God hatched even before the foundations of the earth, even before the earth was formed, God made a plan and the plan was that Jesus would come down as a savior to all mankind and he went through tribulations he went through trials and the Bible says this, he was punished he was chastised it was not for his iniquities but it was for ours it was for yours and for mine he was chastised and he he went and he suffered and he, he bled and he died and he rose again from the cross so that we who were sinners will be reconciled with our Father in heaven. But there were certain statements that people made on the way to the cross of Calvary. And sometimes we, there are statements that people make or positive quotes as it, call, as it is called in the, in the world which sticks with them or which stays with them, a statement which makes an impact. Martin Luther King, for example, said, I have a dream. Many people, when you hear that phrase, I have a dream, you would associate it with Martin Luther King. It was a statement that took a life of its own. Dr. Martin Luther King might have not known or not thought about how much the statement would outlive generations. The Bible says to err is human, to forgive is divine. And many times we, as we, as we acknowledge our, our hearts, as we, as we know in our lives that God has a plan and a purpose for us. And a, a person can speak a word into your life, a positive word, and that can be inspirational. But it's not compared to the word. It's nothing in comparison to the word of God. The word of man can inspire us, but it cannot be compared to the word of God. The word of God is life. The word of God is living. The word of God is a two-edged sword. The word of God is, gives life unto those who believe in him. The word of God can set us free from every uh, captivity that binds us. So the word of God, my brother, my sister, is different from the word of man. You could get wisdom from man's word, but you get life from the word of God. It's in the word of God that there is so much power. There is so much power in the word of God than all of the earth or the world that is the universe that we live in. In fact, the Apostle Paul said this book is the manifold wisdom of God. It's manifold, meaning it's multifaceted or it's got many dimensions. It's multidimensional. You can read the same verse in different ways like you know, like you've never seen it before. You might have, you, you might have experienced this yourself. That you would read a verse or you would read a, a scripture or a chapter or a portion in the word. But each day when you read it, you can read it differently as the spirit of God reveals things unto us. But God can take his word and give us a new revelation. Each time, each time in a specific place, in a specific situation. And that is the word of God, my brother, my sister. There is no other book in the face of this earth which can give you revelation and, and a specific word in your situation like the Bible, the spoken and the living word of God. The Apostle Paul, the beloved of John, uh, the Apostle John, the beloved of Jesus, 
He wrote the, in the book of Revelation and the three epistles referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. He picked up on something and I'd like to read with, with, for you from John chapter 11 verse 45 to verse 52. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Here we find the scripture, a portion of the Bible where the high priest Caiaphas prophesied even though his intention was to kill Jesus and to plot against Jesus yet he prophesied that one man would die for the sins of mankind yet he prophesied that it was because of his calling as a high priest he prophesied the Bible says in verse 51 that Jesus would die for the nation many times you might think in your life that things are happening and it doesn't seem to be going the way it, you want it to go. But even through troubles and even through trials, God's hand is upon you, my brother, my sister. God's mighty hand, when we read his word, it says that he takes us and he keeps us through the fire. That you will not be burned. The priests and the Pharisees in the scripture were so disturbed. They were disturbed that they were suddenly had to confront this healer. They had suddenly had to confront this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They suddenly found that Jesus was doing miracles like never seen before. They suddenly found that he was restoring lives. He was restoring relationships. He was restoring homes. He was raising the dead. All this was something they would never seen before. They lived in the garb of a dead religion. They were religious all right, but they had no life in them. They were going through the days, the mornings and the evenings. They were going through things. They were going through rituals. They were waiting and they were praying for the Messiah. But when the Messiah was standing in front of them, confronting everything in their life, they were not able to bear it. They were not able to surrender to God. They were not able to practice what they preached. <clears throat> they were not able to stand and deliver as God wanted them to do. Yet when the confronting, the convicting power of Jesus, the very presence of Jesus came amidst their midst. When he came and stood, and they were convicted, they were confronted by the miracle working power of God. They responded differently. What did they do? They decided to plot against Jesus. Because they were worried that they would run out of business. They were worried that if, they, they say that if we would let him alone, everyone would believe him. And we would have nowhere to go. The Romans will take our place and our nation. How is it you respond when Jesus confronts you with his word? I want to ask you this question today. How is it you respond when Jesus confronts you when you watch a message or you read his word or you listen to a song and you feel the convicting presence of God in your life? How is it that you respond? Do you respond to say that you would surrender all to him or would you respond by rejecting him? God is waiting for your response, my brother, my sister. 
He wants you to know that he is with you. Yet for him to do something in your life, you have to respond. The priests and Pharisees were afraid because the convicting power of Jesus was confronting the dead things in their life. It was confronting the coldness, the lack of fear, the reverence for God. Yet the thought that he will take away their place and their nation as a people were leaving their life, their lifeless religion. They were unable to leave that and follow God. But that high priest did not know what he was saying, yet he was under the authority of God. Why I want to share this to you today is for you to know in the word of God that everything that happened in the word happened according to what God wanted. According to the Father's will in reference to the times when Jesus went to Calvary. It wasn't, that is why Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own free will. And the Bible, the high priest was, was, was so worked up. And he, but then in all of that, in all of his plotting, in all of his anger, in all of his religion, because the calling of, the, of God was upon the office of the high priest, he prophesied that one man would die for the people and the whole nation should not, should, than the whole nation perishing. Today I want you to know that this Jesus personally died for you on the cross of Calvary. He bled and died and he rose again so that we should have eternal life. He bled and died so that we can walk in victory. He bled and died so that we can be reconciled to the Father in heaven. He bled and died so that we shall have all authority in heaven and in earth. My brother, my sister, you are listening to the powerful word of God. And, and, and we see here that even as Jesus was going and he was, he was making all the attempts to go and to do what the Father wanted him to do. And even though there was resistance, even though there was difficulties, yet God was in control. This is a word for you, my beloved brother and sister. God is in control of your life. No matter which way you go and no matter how you think the wind and the waves are tossing you, God will have the final word. You see, when God blesses someone, you cannot curse him. It was like Balaam. He was paid money. Somebody paid him money and said, go and curse God's people. But when he went there to do it, and he opened his mouth to curse, blessings came out. What he intended to do did not happen. What God intended to do happened in his life. Blessings came out. He meant to say one thing, but another came out. He meant to speak evil, but good came out. God is in control of your life. He made a prophecy come out of an evil, murderous man. Caiaphas was a murderous man. Yet he made a prophecy come out of his mouth saying, one man would die for the nation. My brother, my sister, dear, God speaks to us in multifaceted ways. He could speak to you through a sermon, through a song, through a word, through a child, through any situation in your life. God could speak to you. And he's always speaking to us. Matthew 27, 48. Another situation which seemed as though things were going desperately wrong. Judas went and he took the people, the soldiers, into the garden to betray Jesus. And he had told him, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. He is the one, grab him. But as, but as he went there, and when you think about that statement, he is the one, sees him. It's a very profound statement, even though it was, it, was, it was intended in a different manner. He was betraying Jesus. But if you and I look at it from a Christian point of view as to what that statement means, he is the one, hold on to him. My brother, my sister, 
Jesus is the one in our life. We need to hold on to him. We need to understand in our lives that even though Satan was using Judas to betray, God was still in control. Even though Judas fell away, God was still in control. Jesus was not going to the cross by the accord of somebody else. He was going to the cross because he wanted to die for you and for me. Judas was not going to have the last word. It's Jesus whose word is eternal. It's Jesus whose word is from the beginning and from the end. Hold fast on to him in the good times. Hold fast on to him in the bad times. Hold fast to him when you're in the mountain. Hold on to him when you are in the valley. My beloved brother and sister in Christ, God has a wonderful plan in your life and in my life. He has an awesome plan, a plan that only he can perfect. I want to read with you Matthew chapter 27, verse 20 to verse 26. Something else very profound that you and I need to know. Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, what, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. What Pilate saw that he could not pre prevail at all when he saw, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And if all the people answered and said, his blood be upon us and on our children. Then he realized, released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered them to be crucified. Profoundly, passage of the scripture, which evokes all kinds of feelings and emotions when we read it. Here we find that the same multitude of people who welcomed Jesus a week ago, they said to him, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. To the, and, they, and they sang praises to him. Hosanna to he who comes in the name of the Lord. They sang praises and they laid out palm branches. And they welcomed him. But when Jesus came in, he knew that in a week's time, the palm branches that they laid will be replaced by the palm of their hands. The, 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 all the blessings and the praises that they sang will be replaced by the cursing. Jesus knew that, and yet he walked into that situation. He knew that, yet he came into that situation. He knew that th these people would, would praise him and, and, and they were exalting him and they were doing all the right things. Yet in a week's time, they were willing to give him up to the cross. And they were so much in a murderous rage and it seemed all as though it was not in control. But in the middle of this, the people made a profound statement. This was a revelation to me. They made a profound statement. They, they thought they were going to ask for the blood of Jesus to come upon their life as a curse. And they said, his blood be upon us and on our children. But a person cannot be cursed by the blood of Jesus upon their life. They cannot be cursed by the blood of Jesus upon their children. They were thinking that they were saying it in, in, as a way as though they were taking responsibility for the death of Jesus. But little did they know that they had invited the awesome power of God upon their life. They had invited the liberating power of the blood of Jesus upon their life, the blood upon us, the blood upon our children. What an awesome statement that is in the 21st century. In the middle of your life, in the, in the times that you have, in the, in, the, in the hassles and the cares of this life, in the running about and doing everything, everything stops with this statement. 
which defines everything about the word of God. The blood of Jesus upon us. The blood of Jesus upon our children. The people there, they were murderous all right. They were angry all right. And they thought they were going to get Pilate to, to give them Jesus to be crucified. And they thought they would be cursed because of the blood of Jesus. It's 2,000 years now. There is not a single man or a woman on earth who's had the blood of Jesus upon their life and has been cursed. It's always been a blessing. That is the ultimate record of the Lamb without blemish. That is the ultimate grace of God. That is the ultimate mercy of God. That he would have just one son and he would give that son up on the cross of Calvary. These statements that I'm sharing with you are some awesome statements made before Jesus went to the cross. And the people thought that they were making it in hatred. But it shows us that God was always in control. And it shows us that God is always in control of our life. He works in different ways. The Bible says his ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. His eyes move to and fro upon the earth seeking the righteous as to whom he may bless. My beloved friend in God, is it a healing that you require in your life? Is it deliverance from sin and sinful habits that are encircling your life, that are holding on to you? Is it a lack of peace? Is it a need that you have? The answer lies in Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. The blood of Jesus upon us and upon our children. The blood of Jesus upon our lives. The blood of Jesus upon our churches. The blood of Jesus upon our homes. The blood of Jesus upon our, upon our jobs. Whatever it is in your life that you hold dear, the blood of Jesus. My brother, my sister, the ultimate thing that a preacher can ever share about is the blood of Jesus. We can talk about it as much as we want, but to understand God's love, we need to see the blood of Jesus. We need to be able to know the price he paid. We need to be able to relate with our heart that it was no ordinary price. To shy it away and to turn it away and say that it's okay. It wasn't okay for Jesus to see us die in sin. It's not okay for Jesus to see us mingling with the world and, 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 and doing all kinds of things which are not pleasing to him. That is why he made a way. That is why even when the sinner asked for his blood, he was saved. Even when the righteous pleaded his blood, he is saved. Whoever it is who calls upon the name of the Lord, he is saved. I want to encourage you today. What is the choice that you will make? How would you respond when you see Jesus confronting you with his word? How will you respond when you see Jesus stretching forth and wanting to touch your life? What is the call that you will take? It is my prayer that you and I will always be under the convicting power of God. Always be under the convicting power of the great Holy Spirit. That we will have his goodness and we will declare his blood upon us. His blood upon our lives. His blood upon our children. His blood upon our homes. In every situation when you plead his blood upon you, my brother, my sister, there will be change. There will be change. There can, Jesus can never come into a situation and there cannot be change. Throughout the word of God, throughout the gospels, throughout wherever you read, there is not a single time when Jesus walked into a person's life and there was no change in his life. Be it physical change, be it mental change, be it spiritual change, whatever you want to call it, you will have change for the better when you Invite Jesus into your life. 
the cross of Calvary. That's where it was decided. But even before that, we see that the blood of Jesus was upon his people. The blood of Jesus was upon his children. That is why he said, my sheep hear my voice. Are you willing to hear the voice of God today? I'm just standing before you as a vessel. I've got nothing to do with this. This is personal between you and God, between you and Jesus. To open your heart and declare to him and say, Lord, forgive me, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. I have done wrong things against you, my God. I have displeased you. But I know that you love me. I know that your blood is upon me. I know that your blood is upon my situation. When you declare my brother, my sister to him in your life, get ready for greater change. Get ready for moving into a greater dimension with God. Get ready to see greater revelation in Christ. Let us pray at this time. Even as I lead you into a prayer, even for those of us who need healing on our lives, let us declare the blood of Jesus upon us, the blood of Jesus upon our homes, upon our lives, upon every situation, the blood of Jesus. And as we pray, I do believe with all my heart that God will touch you, that he will heal you, he will restore you, and nothing in your life will ever be the same again. And all the works of the devil will be destroyed in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, once again we thank you this day. We thank you that you teach us, O oh God, that even on the cross of Calvary, even as you were walking to the cross, your blood was spilling, O oh God, everywhere, but it was not in vain. It was shed for the sins of all mankind. It was shed that we who believe in you will have the promise to eternal life. Lord, your blood upon us, your blood upon our lives, upon our loved ones, your blood upon every situation in our life, O oh God. Help us, Master, we pray at this time that your grace and your peace that passeth all understanding will prevail, that people who need healing will receive your touch, that people who need deliverance will be delivered, that people who need joy will find great joy in you, that, Master, you will have great mercy, O God, upon our lives in these last days. We thank you for people who are surrendering their life to you, who are giving their life to you, that there will be great rejoicing in heaven, who will know you as their personal Savior, and that you will set them free from every situation that is binding them. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. My brother, my sister, I thank God for your life and I believe that this word has blessed your heart. If you need prayer, you can call us on the number on your screen. If you need to write to us, give, send us an email or call us or, or write to us on the address of, on the screen. We like to know what God is doing in your life and how he has touched you. And we feel very encouraged by it. Next time till we meet again on New Life in Jesus, God bless you and keep you.